respect to all Indigenous Elders, past and present. In welcoming you, I'd also like to remind you, if you have a mobile de device that makes a noise, now is the time to turn it to silent so that it doesn't interfere with the uh, proceedings. But I'm sure that um, there are a lot of familiar faces here and I'm sure that you're well accustomed to doing that before you come in the room. Now today's topic is, is one that's very dear to my heart and uh, as you'll find out, very dear to the hearts of the speakers we have for you today. Because the relationship between Parliament and the Executive is a crucial one, uh, the powers that the Parliament delegates to the, to the Executive to make subsidiary or secondary laws is uh, a significant one, and of course there's very much interest in uh, scrutinising that that power is exercised appropriately. Now, to discuss the topic of Australian democracy and executive lawmaking, practice and principle, I don't think we could have found two more eminent speakers for you. And uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome today Professor, Professor Cheryl Saunders, AO, and Mr Stephen Argument. Um, many of you will be familiar with their work. Uh, Cheryl is one of our uh, foremost constitutional lawyers. She's the founding director of the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies at the University of Melbourne and a director of studies of public and international law at the Melbourne Law Masters. Author of many, many works, but they include The Australian Constitution, a contextual analysis by Hart Publishing in 2011. It's uh, been a long-standing interest of hers uh, in the, the, the scope and exercise of executive power. And um, in fact, her last lecture for us in 2012 was on that very topic, the scope of executive power. Today, she's going to turn to the um, issue of executive lawmaking. Now, many of you will also know Stephen Argument, who is very well known as the co-author with Professor Dennis Pearce of um, Delegated Legislation in Australia, the standard textbook on the subject. And uh, um, it, Stephen has uh, worked on three editions of, of that work. He's also the legal advisor to two parliamentary um, specialist scrutiny committees for the ACT Assembly, the regulations, uh, the, the, the ACT Assembly um, Committee on uh, Subordinate Legislation um, within the Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety, and of course, as legal advisor to the Senate's, one of the Senate's oldest standing committees, the, the Committee on Regulations and Ordinances. Now, they're going to divide the time between them and they're going to be very civilised about it. Otherwise, I'm going to start dinging um, jugs and things, but I'm sure it won't be necessary. But I'd like to, you to welcome now both our speakers and Stephen Argument will take the podium first. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, so I'm going to talk about the more boring aspects of, of, the more sort of mechanical aspects of this topic. Um, and I th thought I'd start with a cartoon and you might not be able to read it, so I'm I'll read it out to you and this will also help anybody watching online. But in the first box, you have somebody who looks a bit like Moses saying, okay, folks, I've got some good news and some bad news. In the next box, he says, the good news is I've talked him down to 10 commandments. And then in the final box, the figure says, the bad news is there are regulations. And there's an army of people with more tablets lining up behind them. Now, that's, that's a cartoon from a recent, very excellent Canadian text on delegated legislation by Paul Salembio. Um, and I, when, I, when I saw the cartoon, I thought, well, that's very funny and got a copy, a copy of it framed and put on my wall. Um, but I think there's also, it's, it's not just a joke. And I'm going to hit you with some figures. Um, for 2014-2015, the Office of Parliamentary Council, in their annual report, said that they that in that year, 172 bills were introduced, totaling 6,395 pages. For the same period, 253 Executive Council legislative instruments, totaling 8,091 pages, were drafted by, by OPC. In addition to that, a further, and it's only an approximate figure, 103 legislative instruments totalling a further 1,647 pages were drafted by OPC. 
Now compare that with the figures for the first tw um, 26 years of um, federation. In 1930, the Senate Select Committee on Standing Committees noted with concern that no fewer than 3,708 pages of acts had been passed between 1901 and 1927. Now that's in total. Um, that, so that's 3,708 pages compared to 6,395 pages in one year. Um, for delegated le legislation, the figure was 11,263 pages of delegated legislation in 26 years compa compared to 8, 000, at least 8,091 pages in one year. And that's actually not counting all the legislative instruments. One of the reasons I wanted to give this talk was that I don't think many people quite understand the impact the delegated legislation has. They don't understand how much of it there is. Um, I don't think there's enough understanding about, amongst the general public about, about why it's there and, and, and what are the justifications for it. So I thought this would be a good time to restate some fundamental propositions. Here we're using the term executive lawmaking and that term is intended to refer to the making of regulations and other forms of delegated legislation by ministers and the bureaucracy under powers delegated by the parliament in legislation. In my paper, I've been very careful to use the term delegated legislation rather than subordinate legislation. And there's a point to that. Um, while delegated legislation is clearly subordinate to primary legislation, I've preferred to use the term delegated legislation following a lead um, from a recent report by the Hansard Society in the UK on delegated legislation, and it's called The Devil is in the Detail. And in a very early footnote to the report, the Hansard Society say, we do not use the term subordinate legislation as such nomenclature might convey to the general reader that it is of lesser importance than primary legislation, a view this report seeks to dispel. The report goes on to say that delegated legislation is crucial to the effective operation of government and affects almost every aspect of both the public and private spheres. And you can read the rest of it on the screen. Um, why do we have delegated le legislation? Well, the simple answer is that, in essence, it's because parliament can't possibly deal with everything in acts of parliament. Um, Pearson argument, the text that Rosemary referred to, um, offers and has offered since the first edition three possible justifications for delegated legislation or the use of it. Uh, the first is to save pressure on parliamentary time. The second, to deal with legislation that's considered to be too technical or detailed to be suitable for parliamentary consideration. And the third is the, is the sort of flexibility argument to allow for legislation that can deal with rapidly changing or uncertain situations. Now, tr for a long time, regulations were the traditional form of delegated legislation and regulation making powers, as a lot of you be aware, are generally set out in acts, um, allowing the governor general acting on the advice of Exco to make such regulations as are required or permitted by the Act or necessary or convenient to be described for carrying out or giving effect to the Act. Um, this situation has changed over the years and regulations now comprise a surprisingly small proportion of delegated legislation in the Commonwealth. Um, the key piece of legislation to do with delegated legislation, apart from the Acts themselves, is the Legislation Act 2003. Um, that act really only existed since, since Monday of this week because it, it, the Legislative Instruments Act 2003 was renamed and the, um, the relevant amendments took effect on, I think, Monday of this week. And that act deals with the registration, tabling in the parliament and disallowance by either House of Parliament of what are termed legislative instruments. The important thing about this is that Parliament has a supervisory role in relation to delegated legislation as a result of the tabling requirement and as a result of the opportunity of either House to dis disallow most delegated legislation. In the Senate, since 1932, the Senate's been assisted by the Regulations and Ordinances Committee, which examines delegate, all delegated legislation that's disallowable by the, by the Senate. 
um, and advises the advises the Senate in relation to the, the content and merits of that, not the merits, sorry, you shouldn't use that word, the, the, the technical content of the legislation. The RNO committee was actually established, at least in part, in response to the issue of the number of regulations um, that were identified in 1930 by that Senate committee, uh, set by that select committee that I referred to. So the RNO is in, in, a, in a sense a response to that to those concerns about numbers. The RNO committee scrutinises instruments against technical terms of reference, um, and those technical terms of reference um, go to um, things that aren't about the policy of leg legislation. And the committee advises the Senate if it identifies any issues. Um, the committee also raises those issues with, with relevant ministers and will um, ultimately give a protective disallowance motion if, if the issues that they identify aren't resolved to, its, to, this, to the committee's satisfaction. In the paper, I then go on to discuss some recent challenges presented by delegated legislation. Um, they're my issues based on my three years working with the committee and don't reflect the views of the committee. The other thing about the issues that I've listed is that it's not intended to be exhaustive or definitive. There are other issues and it's not intended to be uh, set out in order of importance. Um, I wanted to show you this graph that gives you an indication of the numbers of disallowable instruments scru scrutinised by RNO since 1983-94. And I've got the actual figures, which are actually on the next slide, but that figure for 1983-84 is 800 disallowable instruments. The peak figure uh, for 2008-2009 is 3,004 disallowable instruments. Um, now, for the last couple of calendar years while I've been working with um, the RNO committee, I've been keeping a count of the instruments that actually come across my desk. My um, count for 2014 is that there were seven, 1,722 disallowable instruments, and my count for 2015 is 1,828 disallowable instruments. Now, I'm re reminding you, for the total of the years between 1901 to 1927, the total figure was 3,708 pages. One of the things that has struck me in my three years working with the committee is the relatively small proportion of disallowable instruments that go, comes before the committee that are actually drafted by the Office of Parliamentary Council. Now, the first set of figures I give you are a little bit rough. Um, although I'm, I'm sure they're accurate. Um, in 2011, there were 1,471 legislative instruments registered on the Federal Le Register of Legislative Instruments, as it then was. Of those legislative instruments, 286 were what was called select legislative instruments, and select leg legislative instruments are basically regulations, and regulations are drafted by OPC. So on my rough figuring, that was about 19%. 2012, 2,591 legislative instruments, 13% were SLIs. Um, for a paper I gave in 2013, I noted that to that point, there had been 1,832 legislative instruments of which 235 were SLIs. So that was just under 13% drafted by OPC. For 2014, 2015, again, I've actually I can actually work out what comes across, from what comes across my desk what's been drafted by OPC and what hasn't. And for 2014, it, the percentage was about 17 per cent, and for 2015, the percentage was about 18 per cent. Now, clearly, 18 per cent is better than that 13 per cent figure that I mentioned earlier, but I'm still surprised that the proportion is so low. In a recent text on legislative drafting, um, Professor Helen Zanthaki of the University College London stated, the life of citizens tends to be more directly affected by delegated legislation than it is by general framework laws passed by houses of parliament. Moreover, it is delegated legislation that is applied by most authorities in their interaction with citizens, thus rendering the possibility and danger of corruption all the more pronounced. It is for these reasons that delegated legislation requires the attention and skill of the legislative drafter. <laughs> 
The next challenge I talk about in the paper is the Williams decision. Professor Saunders is going to talk about that. Um, what I wanted, wanted to quickly note though was that since Williams number two, one of the challenges for the R&O committee has been the committees had to be vigilant in trying to ensure that any new programs that are added to the financial framework, supplementary powers regulations, are actually supported by a, an appropriate constitutional authority. And this is in accordance with principle A of the committee's terms of reference, which requires it to scrutinise disallowable legislative instruments to, assure, to ensure that they are in accordance with the statute. So the committee is wanting to make sure that there's a legislative authority for, for these new programs. There's further detail and sort of very, very long detail in the paper about, about the committee's work in that regard. Uh, for me, a possibly more worrying development in the last two years um, has been a, a new practice of making amendments by delegated legislation in anticipation of the same amendments or similar amendments being made later by primary legislation. Um, and that's largely happened in the scope of the future of financial advice reforms. Uh, regulations have been passed and the explanatory material for the regulations has been quite upfront about saying, we will also be making these amendments later um, by primary legislation, but we're doing it now because it's, we want to get it done quickly. Now, not surprisingly, the RNO committee has been concerned about this approach because it's preemptive in that it simply assumes that the Senate will pass um, the relevant primary legislation later in the same form as the regulations that have been made. Um, and the committees had a, had a concern that there's a significant possibility that the subsequent amending bill is either not passed or is not passed in a form that matches the measures in the delegated legislation. The committee has said that it's concerned that the approach might permit a temporary mechanism to turn into a permanent legislative <laughs> artefact. And there's an ongoing concern that this approach fundamentally offends the, the committee's scrutiny principle D, which is to examine disallowable legislative instruments to ensure that they don't contain matter more appropriate for parliamentary enactment. Now, it seems like it's a kick me proposition if, if delegated legislation is justified on the basis of we're going to make these amendments later in primary legislation. Well, if, if it's suitable for primary legislation, why are you doing it in delegated legislation? It doesn't make sense. There are some other issues dealt with in the paper that I won't talk about um, here. One is the use of legislative rules in preference to regulation. Um, another is issues arising from the federal court decision in Perrott and the Attorney General of the Commonwealth, um, which deals with the prohibition on remaking legislative instruments that are same in substance as disallowed legislative instruments, and the issue of skeletal legislation. There in the paper. I wanted to try and quickly talk about um, some issues in the United Kingdom because I think we can draw some things out of it. On the 26th of October 2015, the House of Lords decided to withhold agreement to the tax credits, income thresholds and determination of rates amendments, Regulation 2015. The effect of this decision was roughly similar to the Senate disallowing a regulation. Um, now, it turns out that the House of Lords has apparently only taken this action six times since the 1950s. The regu regulations in question evidently contain measures that were very important to the UK government, especially because they involve revenue measures. The response to the House of Lords doing this was the Prime Minister David Cameron was reported to be, and I quote, furious, unquote, with the House of Lords. Mr Cameron therefore invited Lord Strathclyde to conduct a review of statutory instruments and could consider how more certainty and clarity could be brought to their passage through Parliament. The report of this so-called Strathclyde review was produced within two months. The Strathclyde review gave three options for reform. The first, surprisingly, was to take away the House's Lord's powers in relation to delegated legislation altogether. The second was to retain the power of the House of Lords, but in effect to codify the power, but not only codify the power, but codify the power in such a way as to effectively restrict it to the point where it wouldn't ever be used. 
And the third option was to create a new procedure which would be set out in statute, allowing the ha House of Lords to invite the House of Commons to think again when there was a disagreement about the content of um, the content of uh, the le delegated legislation. Now, the Strathclyde Review favoured the third option. I make the following brief points. I don't think that this UK example can be explained away simply on the basis that the House of Lords is unelected. My main point is that I could not imagine anything like the Strathclyde Review happening here in Australia. No matter how furious the Senate's disallowance of re regulation made a Prime Minister, I cannot imagine a reaction in which one of the options suggested in the response was to take away the Senate's power to disallow delegated legislation. Um, I won't run, run you through these in detail, but to give you an example of how active the Senate has been in terms of disallowance, uh, the, I've got this table and the figures are actually in the paper, but the, the peak figure is for the year 2000 when 112 notices were given. Um, 20 notices were given in 2013, 31 in 2014, and 21 in 2015. And you might be surprised by this, but in, in, since the year 2000, 59 disallowance motions have actually been passed by the Senate. And the sky hasn't fallen in. Um, I don't recall seeing any reports of the of Prime Minister or fury in the press. Um, I won't take you through this because of the time, but I've set out some figures on the slide, but they're also in the paper about the number of, um, number of notices given by the RNO committee. Um, you'll see that all but two of the ones that are listed there have actually been withdrawn. And they're withdrawn because the committee eventually reaches a point with ministers where the, the committee gets what it wants or the committee's happy enough with the outcome. Uh, two final things. One is I wanted to put in a plug for um, the recent work of the, of the UK Hansard Society. They've produced, produced two excellent reports on legislation and the legislative process. There's the devil in the detail one and also an earlier one about legislation generally. Those reports demonstrate to me that we've got some common issues um, in relation to legislation, but um, I come out of it actually thinking that Australia is in a much better position. The, um, the devil in the detail report refers to unsatisfactory scrutiny procedures for delegated legislation in Australia. I won't, in the UK, sorry. I won't take you through them, but in the UK they have a patchwork of committees that look at delegated legislation, and obviously the, the response the response to the, this disallowance recently suggests that things aren't working very well if the, if the first reaction to something being disallowed is um, to take away the power. Um, as I've said, the Senate regularly disallows delegated legislation without there being anything like the recent reaction in the UK. In my view, this demonstrates a maturity in the scrutiny of delegated legislation in, in Australia, particularly in the Senate, that includes an acceptance by the executive that delegated legislation will be scrutinised, questioned and even disallowed in the Senate. And that's a good thing in my view. Thank you. Well, now it's my turn. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be involved in the Senate Lecture Series again, speaking this time uh, with my friend and colleague uh, Stephen Argument. We've discussed these things together many times over the years. Uh, we bring different perspectives to the topic. Stephen speaks as an insider, although I know that term makes him uncomfortable, uh, and I'm very much an outsider coming from uh, the ivory towers, in this case, of Melbourne. Um, one of the most basic, uh, but first, I don't have a PowerPoint, so let me give you some sort of uh, view of where I'm going with this. I propose to build on what Stephen's already said in the following way. I'll begin by laying out the framework of constitutional principle within which executive lawmaking takes place. And in doing that, I'll draw attention to the characteristics of parliament that make it the appropriate forum for the function of lawmaking. I'll acknowledge, of course, that executive lawmaking has its place, albeit one that necessarily is limited, because it cannot replicate what parliaments bring to the process. 
I'll suggest that there are features of our system of government that encourage executive lawmaking creep as a consequence both of institutional dynamics um, and the context of government or both. And these require the balance to be reassessed from time to time. I'll take you to one of the last major reassessments in 1992 to demonstrate the extent to which that balance can become distorted over time. And I'll conclude by speculating on what such a review might find today and in that event what appropriate responses might be. So let me begin with the principles which hopefully will be familiar to everyone here. One of the most basic of all of our constitutional principles is that law is made by Parliament. At one level, that principle can be understood in symbolic terms. The power of the state to change the rules by which the whole community is bound is an extraordinary one. As the only elected institution in the Australian system of government, Parliament is the only body with sufficient legitimacy to exercise a power of this kind. The principle that Parliament makes law, however, rests not only on arguments from symbolism, but on functional logic as well. In both composition and mode of operation, Parliament is designed as the appropriate institution to carry out the high function of lawmaking. Parliament comprises competing voices, representing diverse community views. It meets in public, requiring new laws to be publicly justified in advance. The public proceedings of Parliament also enable voters to hold their representatives to account for the stance they take on particular decisions. These principles and practices don't exist for the benefit of Parliament itself. The question of which organ of state should make law is not an inter-institutional game. The requirement for law to be made by Parliament, with all that flows from it, exists for the benefit of the people who will be subject to the law and from whom the authority to make new law derives. Of course it's trite that it's not practicable for all new law to be made by Parliament directly. It's for a very long time been the case that a great deal of law is made by the executive branch uh, acting pursuant to authority from Parliament. Classically, the executive branch for this purpose refers to the Governor General in Council. This has the advantage of involving the highest level of executive government for the significant function of executive lawmaking and doing so in a way that engages the collective responsibility of ministers who are accountable to the legislature. Constitutional proprieties also are preserved by the formal capacity of parliament to repeal the enabling legislation and by procedures for ex post facto parliamentary scrutiny of the exercise of its delegated authority. But however good those safeguards are, they can't capture the properties of lawmaking by parliament itself, hence the need to keep the practice of delegation within bounds. Delegation of lawmaking to the executive might be justified by reference to substance or purpose. In terms of substance, the principal guideline must be the significance of a proposed new rule in the sense that matters of sufficient importance are left to primary legislation. In one way or another, this consideration underlies most of the matters listed in the current legislation handbook, including the catch-all reference in paragraph B to significant questions of policy. In terms of purpose, it may be accepted that delegation of legislative power to the executive branch is useful for a range of purposes, to keep unnecessary detail out of primary legislation, to deal with at least some matters that are transitory, and to make optimal use of the time of parliament and its members in these ways. But claims that matters are too complex for parliament, that there wasn't enough time to include some matters in the principal legislation, or even that the necessary policy decisions weren't made when the time came for introduction of the bill are unacceptable reasons for leaving to the executive lawmaking authority that should be exercised by parliament itself. It's received wisdom in Australia that there are effectively no judicially enforceable constitutional limits on the extent of the lawmaking authority that can be delegated to the executive branch by the Commonwealth Parliament. Whether this is correct or not, and I would hate to put it to the test in an extreme case, uh, judicial review certainly has more bite once the, once the delegated legislative power is exercised. 
Executive lawmaking is just another form of executive action, in a sense. Too creative use of delegated legislative power may be held to be unlawful by courts, and there are plenty of examples of that. But whatever the position in the courts, the legislature itself plays a crucial role in scrutinising the practice of executive lawmaking and keeping it within appropriate bounds. The effectiveness of this role in the Commonwealth sphere de has depended historically heavily on the Senate and on the activities of the two Senate scrutiny committees, uh, uh, which Stephen has uh, described. I agree with Stephen that thanks to these arrangements, scrutiny of executive lawmaking in the Commonwealth sphere has an edge over many comparable jurisdictions. But I don't think that the parliament can afford to rest on its laurels. In any Westminster style parliamentary systems, system, there are incentives to expand the reach of executive lawmaking. The very attributes that make parliament the appropriate lawmaking body also make it a nuisance from the standpoint of executive government. Ministers, their advisers and their departments are not naturally programmed to spell out policies in detail in public in advance of their application, to debate them with opposition members, to make changes on contentious points and to delay implementation while all this occurs. Consistently with the functional attributes of the executive branch, their typical modus operandi is the opposite to work quickly and confidentially in an environment in which everyone is broadly on the same page, all going well. It's natural enough in these circumstances to try to minimise the exposure of government policy to parliament if that can be done. And in Australia, the problem is exacerbated, no doubt ironically, by uncertainty about outcomes in the Senate. I'm not trying to be cynical here. Government is no easy task. There's a genuine tension between the roles of parliament and executive government in our system. In some respects, this also reflects a tension between values, openness and inclusion on the one hand, and speed and efficiency on the other. A balance needs to be struck that preserves the constitutional essentials. Given the dynamics within the system, exactly where this lies may need to be reviewed from time to time. One relatively recent occasion on which there was a comprehensive review of the practice of executive lawmaking in the Commonwealth sphere was the report of the Administrative Review Council in 1992 that led ultimately to the enactment of the Legislative Instruments Act 2003. I was the president of the ARC at that time, so let me briefly take the role of insider. By 1992, many of the elements of the current system uh, of executive lawmaking were in place. Uh, executive lawmaking in the form of regulations made by the Governor General had been practiced since 1901. These were published in a systemic way under one piece of legislation and were subject to tabling and disallowance under another. The Senate Standing Committee on Regulations and Ordinances had been in operation since 1932. The Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills had been established more recently in 1982, but still had been in operation for 10 years. The immediate catalyst for the ARC review was reflection on whether, and if so, to what extent, executive lawmaking should be brought under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act. While executive lawmaking is executive action, it presently is excluded from that act by the threshold requirement that action to which the Act applies must be of an administrative character. And on one view, there was much to be gained by bringing all executive action under the umbrella of the same judicial review legislation. But in the end, the ARC decided against that path because not all the provisions of the ADJR Act would apply to executive lawmaking. By way of obvious example, the requirements of procedural fairness are well adapted to administrative actions affecting particular individuals, but arguably are less suited to action of a legislative kind, which needs fair procedures of its own. So the ARC embarked on a project to examine the need for an act dealing with executive lawmaking that would complement the ADJR Act. And to that end, it had to examine what was going on. And some of its most striking findings were as follows. The traditional form of executive lawmaking through regulations or statutory rules 
on which the then current legislative framework was predicated, had become the tip of a very large iceberg. In addition to these, there were 115 other rules of a legislative kind, with almost as many different names, made by a variety of people in the executive branch. By 1990, the number of these other legislative instruments more than doubled the number of statutory rules and were solely responsible for a huge growth in executive lawmaking over the previous decade. The Senate committees had, of course, picked up on this phenomenon. One consequence was that many individual enabling statutes now required the legislative instruments that they authorised to be made to be subjected to the requirements for tabling and disallowance. But this was an ad hoc arrangement. No one knew how many other such instruments there were which had escaped the scrutiny process altogether. And nor were there systemic procedures for publishing and therefore ensuring public access to these other categories of disallowable instruments. On other matters, the Council reported considerable discrepancies between official guidelines on the matters appropriate for executive lawmaking and the practice that actually was followed. Drafting quality was variable. There were no general requirements for consultation before rules were made in, contract, in contrast to the position in some of the Australian states. And nor was there a requirement for sunsetting of legislative instruments, again, contrary to the practice in some states. Now, the outcome of the ARC review will be familiar to many of you, and I won't go through the details uh, here. Implementation took more than a decade, quite an amusing fact in, its, in itself. Many of the recommendations of the ARC were watered down along the way. But even so, the result was a considerable improvement over what had existed before. <coughs> A single Legislative Instruments Act um, applied the same procedures for tabling, disallowance, consultation, sunsetting and publication on a single federal register to almost all executive lawmaking. A better attempt, attempt was made in the legislation handbook to identify the appropriate border between primary uh, and delegated legislation and administrative reorganisation sought to ensure that a single office based in the Attorney General's Department, had responsibility to oversee the quality of the drafting of all legislative instruments. Now, if we were now to conduct a comprehensive review of the practice of executive lawmaking, what would we find? This isn't such a review, I hasten to assure you, but let me suggest what might be amongst the principal points. First, of course, the amount of delegated lawmaking remains vast, uh, and Stephen has spoken about that. I'm not sure that that's where the principal problems would be likely to lie, however. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, at least some executive lawmaking seems to being be being used for matters more appropriate for primary legislation. More work needs to be done on the extent to which this is so, but let me just mention four indicators of that. Rather alarmingly, this term skeleton legislation seems to be becoming a term of art. Recent reports of the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills regularly draw attention uh, to proposed laws that delegate matters that may be considered more suitable for parliamentary enactment, in some instances in relation to matters that are, and I quote, central elements of the legislative scheme. There is the phenomenon to which Stephen pointed in his slides of the emerging practice of implementing significant new policy initiatives through executive lawmaking in anticipation of the enactment of legislation by the parliament. And as a final illustration, the regulations made to give parliamentary cover to the host of Commonwealth spending schemes in the wake of the first Williams decision clearly provide for important policy initiatives inconsistently with the appropriate scope for delegated legislation, as well as being drafted in extremely odd form. A third point that might appear from a review of current executive lawmaking practice is the development of a hierarchy of delegated legislation within the executive branch. Stephen referred to the most obvious manifestation of this in his remarks as well, the creation of that category of legislative rules uh, from, 19, from 2013. 
These appear to differ from the wide category of legislative instruments to which I've already referred in the sense that they're made by a minister and are used instead of regulations made by the Governor General with whatever follows from that in procedural terms. One catalyst for this development appears to have been a desire to rationalise the resources of the Office of Parliamentary Council, but the change also causes the distinction to be drawn between categories of matters appropriate to be handled in regulations and rules respectively, with more important matters apparently to be assigned to the former. And it seems to me that there might be a need for vigilance to ensure that recognition of a category of superior executive lawmaking in this way is not used as a rationale to expand the scope of executive lawmaking itself. A final piece of the current practice of the uh, current pattern of the practice of executive lawmaking concerns consultation. The Administrative Review Council's original recommendations on consultation as the form of procedural fairness most appropriate for decisions of a legislative character were watered down in the Legislative Instruments Act. A 2008 review of that act noted a significant shortfall in the adequacy of consultation practices and reporting to Parliament in relation to them, while also declining to make consultation mandatory or judicially enforceable. The provisions of what now is the Legislation Act 2003 remain extremely weak in this regard. It need hardly be said that the more important the matters dealt with through executive lawmaking, the more important are consultation procedures. Two distinguished commentators have drawn attention to at least one other way in which any significant expansion of the scope of executive lawmaking has implications for current practice. Avoidance of policy considerations by the Senate scrutiny committees has served Australia well in the past in the sense that it has enabled the committees to establish a culture of bipartisanship. It constrains the effectiveness of the committees in other ways, however, when executive-made laws deal with matters of significant policy concerns. Objections raised by the committees on procedural grounds, drawing attention to the width of executive lawmaking, are too easily fobbed off by ministers. Ironically, one frequent response of ministers to the scrutiny of bills committee in this context is that the resulting instrument can always be disallowed, although presumably not on the basis of an analysis by the Regs and Ordinances Committee. In my paper, I'm unable to resist the temptation to note that there is, no, there is since the ARC was abolished, uh, there is no body uh, there may now no longer be a body capable of conducting a comprehensive review of executive lawmaking uh, in the Commonwealth sphere. But it's worth noting, nevertheless, what possible responses to such a review might be on the assumption that the signs of expansion of the scope of executive lawmaking were confirmed. It might be too late to return the entire genie to the bottle. It's not too late, however, for a frank, honest and informed debate on how we want the laws under which we live to be made. Even if the result were to shift the boundaries between primary and executive lawmaking in particular respects, it should also have the advantage of, of settling them more firmly, thus stemming, at least for the moment, executive lawmaking creep. On the assumption that new criteria recognise some role for executive lawmaking on matters of substance, new procedures would be at needed, at least for instruments in this category. These might include, for example, mandatory consultation requirements along notice and comment lines, subject to judicial review, an affirmative resolution procedure, and a role for the scrutiny committees in drawing policy issues to the attention of senators without necessarily becoming embroiled in the merits of the issues themselves. These, policy, these possibilities are not mutually exclusive and no, nor are they exhaustive. But if the scope of executive lawmaking expands, it seems to me that the case for enhanced procedures is irrefutable. Think of them as trying to realise a little more fully the values that the assignment of the lawmaking to function to Parliament assumes when that function is entrusted to the executive branch. Thank you.
Thank you very much to both of our speakers. We've, the timing has been perfect. Congratulations to both of you. Uh, and that means that we do have a little time for, for questions and discussion from the audience. So if you do have a, a question or a comment, I'd invite you to come to one of the microphones either in the centre aisle downstairs or there's also a microphone upstairs. Uh, while people are thinking about their questions, however, and coming to the microphone, um, you both, or Stephen, you particularly tantalisingly mentioned the um, Parrot decision, and um, I wanted to ask if you'd like to expand on that a, a little, um, just to give some context to the question. S more or less since the, the, the Regulations and Ordinances Committee was established in the early 30s, that there has been this um, a develop evolution of the, the power of, of Parliament to exercise supervision of, of executive lawmaking. And we think of the things that were happening in the early 30s, like those infamous waterside um, uh, regulations, transport workers regulations, where the um, every time the, the government would make them, the Senate would disallow them, and there was no, there was no time lapse between um, the, the making and the disallowance. And I think that happened 12 times. Government makes the regs, Senate disallows them. Government makes the regs, Senate disallows them. And that, that led a, a little later to a, a mechanism or a provision in, in the supervising legislation about the government not being able to remake an instrument that was the same in substance as the one that had just been disallowed by the Senate, unless an interval of six months had passed, or unless the, the House that had disallowed um, re revoked its, its disallowance, changed its mind. So that, that mechanism lasted well for quite a, you know, half a century. And then we had uh, the interesting cases of some family law um, fee, application fee regulations that increased the fees and uh, were disallowed and very quickly a new set of regulations were made with a five dollar difference in the amount of the fee. But importantly it was a five dollar increase. Increase and the problem in the with amount the fees fee. was that they were too now, high. Now I'm going to hand over to you. Oh, My sorry. question is would you like to comment on, 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 the, oh, no. <laughs> um, on, on that decision? Oh, well, this is just my view. It's certainly not a committee view. But, but Mike and Rosemary very, very adequately explained the, the background to it. But what the, what the Parrot decision does is what, what the federal court decided in Parrot was, in effect, that, that the prohibition on remaking something that was the same in substance within six months would only come into effect if the second piece of, if the second set of regulations were in effect identical to the first set. And um, which in my view just rips the heart out of what the provision does and, and creates a real, a real challenge. Um, the, the point that I always make about this decision is that the initial regulations were disallowed because the fees increases were too high. And it's, it almost, it's almost an insult that, that, the, that the subsequent set of regulations which were found to be okay actually increased, increased the, the fees by a further 5%. That just defies logic to me, but that's just my view. And there was some jurisprudence oh, yes. in the meantime about to explaining what the courts thought the same in substance yeah. meant. Would you like to comment well, on that? Um, the, I have to be careful here because I don't want to insult the federal court judge, but the, um, the, the jurisprudence that, that the R&O committee had been relied on was, was a 1940-something case um, that I can't remember off the top of my head. And it seems to, if you look at the, if you look at the um, federal court decision, the federal court judge has interpreted the, the earlier authority in a way that even a bad constitutional lawyer like me uh, thinks it was just doesn't make sense. I just, I just can't see how the judge interpreted the earlier authority in the way that he did. But uh, the, the outcome, I guess, is at the moment that, that both sets of regu regulations were disallowed and have not yet been remade. And, and the, parent, the, the, peop, the applicants in Parrot, or some of the applicants in Parrot, did initially appeal to the uh, full federal court, but that appeal was unfortunately recently 
discontinued. So, so parent is so the parent decision is sitting there as some sort of authority. Mm. It is a can I just say, it, I mean it is a pity that the appeal didn't go ahead. I mean I sitting there listening to both of you um, describing the problem, and I agree it's a terrible problem and somehow needs to be fixed uh, as far as the scrutiny of delegated legislation is concerned. On the other hand, it's hard for the court to decide. Uh, when something is sufficiently different uh, in substance. You know, what if it had gone down by a dollar uh, or two dollars mm. or even five dollars? I mean, at what point does the court say, oh, no, all right, you've dropped it enough? You know, a hundred dollars. But they, they increased they increase <laughs> know, fees no, that I were too high by five dollars. I understand. <laughs> And, you know, are we asking the courts to make policy decisions, which is why we elect well, members the, of parliament? I mean, I can see why the court wants to keep out of it. On oh, the yeah. other hand, to, to completely neuter this arrangement, which is, as you say, has been in place for a long time, is, is also a huge problem. Mm. Anyway, I, I thought I'd given you lots of time to start coming to the microphone with your questions. They're Thank you, sir. Fascinated by parents. Yes. No, Please no, go ahead. No surprise to Stephen. I agree completely with what Stephen said about... Uh, the uh, same in substance, and as a, as a drafter, I would have, have, have advised the client that we couldn't do it, and they presumably then would have gone and got uh, uh, government solicitor advice that said uh, what the risks were of doing it, and yes, it was all right. Uh, I, I've, I've got a few things I could ask, but I'll just raise one particular issue of uh, incorporation by reference. Um, I think in particular of things like Australian standards, uh, which, as many people will know, um, you have to buy. So we put into law through subordinate legislation uh, and then incorporation by reference of something that's not publicly available to the individual. Uh, I know, having been with the Attorney Generals for over well, 20 years or so, uh, we did have a, uh, a, a principle of um, access to, to law, access to justice, including access to law, which was behind uh, uh, freely and behind com law and behind publication, free publication of legislation when other countries um, required you to pay for it. Do, uh, do either of you have any, any comments on the suitability of subordinate legislation incorporating material that's not, read, not uh, freely available to the, uh, to the citizen? Do you want to see? Uh, well, thank you, Patrick. Both the, um, both the scrutiny of Bills Committee and certainly for about the last 12 months, the Regs Awards Committee have been raising that access point, um, that very access point that you've made, um, and seeking advice from ministers, um, seeking advice from ministers as, as to whether that uh, material can nevertheless be made freely available in some way. One thing I learned from a response just recently was that, and something I didn't know before, is that apparently all state libraries and all, and the National Library the proposition was that they all hold freely available copies of, of um, Australian standards. Um, now, I didn't know that. Um, not that that solves your problem, though no, the, the committee's been quite vigilant lately on trying to ensure free public access to all this material. I also think it's outrageous, actually, as a matter of principle. I mean, it's completely contrary to the rule of law. Um, uh, and I think, and it clearly arises when there's formal incorporation in regulations of Australian standards or anything else. Uh, but I think we can see the problem in other contexts as well, when intergovernmental agreements underpin a scheme and, and so on. I note, and I'd be interested in Stephen's view on this or, or anybody in the audience, as I was frantically trying to get myself on top of whatever had happened in the changes to the uh, legislation act that came into effect last Monday, um, that there is some capacity for parliamentary council to put on the federal register uh, other instruments that might illuminate the meaning of legislation. And I, Notifiable instruments. Yeah, and I just wondered how that was going to be used uh, so, and yes. whether it would be used for some of these and other associated purposes. Yes, on the, the, the home page for any instrument, there's capacity to, to add uh, material to it. But how will that actually be used? Do we know? Is there a policy? I'm not method? sure. I, uh, I, we, I, from my, my uh, experience, uh, I haven't... Uh, done that with Australian standards, for example, and also various conventions that, are, uh, that uh, international organisations require you to pay for, which are incorporated in legislation. 
Absolutely. It seems to me that now, particularly now you have that clear requirement, you should have yeah. the Australian standards, you should have the international treaties, you should have intergovernmental agreements. Anything that assists you to understand legislation should be publicly available in the same place. Can I, can I say something about that? The, um, this concept of a notifiable instrument, I think, is borrowed from the ACT, which it, in its Legislation Act, if an instrument incorporates an Australian standard by reference, the Australian standard becomes a notifiable instrument and has to go, is supposed to go on the, on the register. However, there's a, there are provisions in the Legislation Act that's, that allow the provisions making those things notifiable instruments to be overridden and they are most often overridden in relation to Australian standards. And the, the response, the answer that's always given is that there are commercial reasons why these things can't be put on the register. Uh, one of the things that the ACT committee has been relatively successful in, in securing is that where that happens, uh, departments routinely make, say in, in the instrument that copies of it can be are available during business hours at this address. So that's one so, they, so there's the mechanism, they, they get around it, but they also make some attempt to address it. Not much comfort uh, for those who don't no live in the stepping up, I have another. Uh, did you have a supplementary? A supplementary question. Um, Stephen, again, you mentioned uh, the a, a, a practice of um, making regulations first and then making an act or amending an act later to, to do what the regulations did. Uh, there is also a practice in, um, and my particular area is transport uh, regulation, uh, where the authority is given a power to, to give exemptions uh, within safety parameters, um, and agencies will, um, I'm thinking particularly of aviation and maritime, uh, will uh, use the exemption power as a, an immediate fix to say, all right, you can do this, so you're exempt from the laws that would stop you doing that, and we'll get around to changing the regulations later. Uh, now, uh, my, my uh, particular concern I have is that effectively that means agencies can just make up the law as they go along and, and uh, with, effectively with no scrutiny uh, at all. Now, now, my question is whether well, I, I, I suppose whether there would be any scope for the Senate committee to be involved in any sort of scrutiny of that sort of activity. All I can say, Patrick, is that, is that, we, is that the committee does actually look at those sort of exemptions and does, um, it's particularly in situations where exemptions is given and it's explained that, that it's to cover a situation that's intended to be yeah. fixed by regulation later, the committee's vigilant in I, monitoring I that that actually happens. I, I'm aware with some of the civil aviation exemptions that the, civil committee, aviation is the, the committee has, uh, has commented on, uh, on exemptions which have a time limit of generally of two years constantly being renewed and the question is well why are you why don't you get around to fixing up the, the regulations? The, the committee asks that question all the time. Uh, no. But now though not, not all of those exemptions are legislative instruments um, and so they don't come to the committee's attention. So all of this is happening beneath your your purview. Yeah. You know, you should call it a Charles the First clause to make the Henry the Eighth clause. Yes. It well, sounds good. Thank you. Um, th there was one further comment. Oh, do you have a question, sir? Yes, one moment. Please, please come to the microphone. Um, I'm an agency-based, um, occasional drafter of delegated legislation, yet to infuriate a prime minister. Um, yet to um, earn the ire of the Regulations and Ordinances Committee, I'm thankful to say. But um, I wonder what advice um, Stephen had uh, for people like me, producing 77% in a recent year of the delegated legislation that came before the committee. I wondered what, what advice you had to me as someone um, sitting at the keyboard um, faced with the task of producing delegated legislation. Um, what, what the obvious thing to say is that, is that at the very least you should keep, you should read the R&O committee reports as they come out. Um, one thing about that is that up until about two years ago, the, the committee didn't routinely publish reports. And so it was a bit hard to work out what sort of, what were the issues that were exercised in the committee's minds. Um, but it's now much easier because after every meeting, the committee produces a report and that those reports are quite 
quite a lot of detail about what's going on. But the the flip side, sort of, it's doesn't. This doesn't answer your question, but, but what your what your question goes to is that Section 16 of what's now the Legislation Act imposes on the first parliamentary council an obligation to take steps to ensure. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, probably paraphrasing badly, but to ensure high standards of drafting in in the Com in the Commonwealth. And my view is that. Given the amount of um, given the amount of delegated legislation that's drafted by people like you and, and other people and agencies, the, the parliamentary council should be very proactive in in assisting you. Now, when I was a drafter for six six years, that obligation existed, and I think it was then on the secretary of the attorney general's department. And Patrick, who was, who asked the other question, who was my boss, we used to lament about the fact that. There was no evidence of, of, the, of the Secretary of the Attorney General's Department doing anything in relation to that obligation. In the course of the long correspondence that the RNO committees recently had over the legislative rules issue, First Parliamentary Council has told the committee that indeed they are taking steps to, um, you know, in, in pursuit of that Section 16 obligation. So I, I suppose my question is hasn't that affected you yet? Um, not yet, but I look forward to having the standard of my drafting improved. <laughs> Thank you. Can I, can I just ask you, just before you leave the microphone? Yes. I mean, so you, you, you must be just one of a, a quite a considerable number of people um, who draft delegated legislation for the Commonwealth. Is there some sort of network that um, you not get that together I'm, on? Yeah, some not that I'm aware of, Professor. Yeah. Um, I mean, that would seem to be a sensible thing as well. But, indeed. Um, um, you know, so I, as I say, I'm an, I'm, I'm an occasional drafter. Mm. Um, and it's um, highly likely that if there was a network, um, I wouldn't know about it anyway. Right. Mm. Um, but um, but certainly it's the sort one of initiatives thing to say that's you, that you should keep an eye on the regs and ordinances committee report and know that yeah. that would be sensible. But yeah. there are probably trends and um, particular issues that come out every year that it would be sensible to have some sort of loose network whereby you Quite could so. um, look at that information easily enough. Yep. Yep. Good idea. Quite so. Thank you. Anything I could think of. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. But I just, you know, poor. Fit. Well, sadly, insiders and outsiders all, our, our time is up, but it's been a, a tremendously important topic to discuss this afternoon. And I'd like you to thank our two very distinguished speakers for giving up their time. And uh, thank you for coming today.